All right, well, welcome everyone to the um, educational event that we're hosting with National Brain Tumor Society and the CERN Foundation. And we are delighted to have um, two remarkable guests here with us. And I will allow you to go ahead and introduce yourself, Dr. Ellison, if you'd like to start. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Ellison, and I work at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, where I'm chair of pathology. Wonderful. And I'm uh, Mark Gilbert, and I'm uh, a an, an neuro-oncologist, and I'm the chief of the neuro-oncology branch at the National Cancer Institute at the National Institutes of Health. Great, and thank you both so much for joining us. Um, I know that we've been discussing molecular diagnostics over the past, um, really, decade, and it's an evolving subject. And I think that with this latest update, it seems like the information is um, very important to the community, uh, but it's also somewhat difficult to understand, I think, from reading some of the literature. And so this is really helpful for us to just disseminate the new information and let everybody know kind of what the impact is. And we're gonna start actually with just diagnostic basics. And um, especially for families that are just now being diagnosed, giving that overview of what that looks like. And then we're going to go into molecular profiling and discussing that, um, including these impact, uh, the C impact updates. Um, then we'll talk about the clinical impact that these molecular updates have. And then finally, we're just going to wrap up with talking about the neuro oncology community and collaborations that I think it's so important to feature that and how those were um, essential in getting where we are at today with this information. So um, I'm Kim Walgren and I am with the CERN Foundation. And um, thanks to the team at um, the National Brain Tumor Society for hosting this event. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, for diagnostic basics, um, Dr. Allison, can you explain the process that happens behind the scene when someone is newly diagnosed with a pendymoma? Yes. So. The important process of making the diagnosis starts when the neurosurgeon removes the tumor tissue from the patient and submits it to pathology for analysis. And the pathologist's role really is to make a diagnosis based on the latest World Health Organization classification. And in the case of brain tumors, the tissue is processed and turned into very thin sections which are placed on glass slides so that the pathologist can then look down the microscope at the fine detail of the tumor cell. And we use various stains to highlight aspects of the cells as we look at them down the microscope. And from this sort of information, we can tell what sort of tumor type we're dealing with. And we relate what we see uh, to the terms in the classification to choose the most appropriate diagnosis from the classification for future patient management. Now, that process has been going on for pretty much a hundred years now. And so um, the process in the last 10 to 20 years has really evolved substantially. And now we can analyze aspects of the cells on those uh, tissue sections on the slides in a much more refined way using molecular techniques. Immunistic chemistry can tell us about features in the cells. Inter interphase fluorescence and cytohybridization can tell us about molecular attributes in the cells. But as well as this, we now take the tumor uh, tissue itself, and rather than processing it into those thin sections on glass slides, we do sophisticated analyses to look at genetic aspects of the tumor cells, what's gone wrong in the genes in those cells, and also other aspects of the molecular biology of the tumor cells. And these are tests done in pathology, but done not by the histopathologist looking down the microscope, but by molecular pathologists who are in charge of the gene sequencers and other technologies that can give us so much more in the way of information about the biology of these cancer cells. And as time's gone on, uh, we've adapted the World Health Organization classification to these new advances, letting us 
get more information uh, through to our clinical colleagues and the patients in the way that we choose these more refined diagnoses based around the molecular aspects of the tumor. Okay, great. And from what I understand with ependymoma, you have the, the traditional histopathology, and now we have new information about the molecular sequencing. And then is the third component, the location of the tumor, is that also important um, to note on that report? Absolutely. And so, you know, the histopathology has been around a long time and forms the basis of the uh, report that the pathologist um, presents to his clinical colleagues. But now we're finding that we're adding in molecular information that's really come out in the last 10, 15 years or so. And we know for a pandemonium that some really important advances have been made that allow us to separate out tumors that look the same down the microscope, but actually have key biological differences. And this is really what molecular advances have done for a pandemonium. And in CERN supported trials, uh, we made some important discoveries about uh, 12 years ago when uh, we first described uh, molecular abnormalities in a pandemoma that went on to a key study um, led at St. Jude, which defined the genetic landscape of uh, a pandemoma. And uh, through this, we now know that uh, supertentorial tumors have certain abnormalities not seen in ependymomas elsewhere in the brain. And so uh, that helped to adjust our view of the WHO classification in 2016 uh, by adding in this new entity, ependymoma relay fusion positive. And so this is an example of a molecular advance that's influenced diagnostic practice in the classification. The final um, advance really that came out about five years ago uh, was a very nice uh, study of the epigenetics of ependymomas uh, looked at through a process called DNA methylation profiling. And this was a study led from the German Cancer Research Center and um, led in fact by uh, Christian Peitler, who's a CERN fellow. And this study really showed us the heterogeneity of a pendemoma across the three anatomic sites, the supertentorial compartment, the posterior fossa compartment, and the spinal cord. And so we saw differences at these different sites uh, that really, I think, impact the way in which we look at a pendemoma and potentially down the road will treat a pendemoma differently. So those are the ways in which advances in the understanding of the biology have shaped our view of diagnostic practice and classification. Great, and when, when this is all kind of happening behind the scenes, you know, how long does it take to get back with families? Um, what is a typical response? Is it different uh, with the pathology and the molecular? I imagine there's, you know, it takes different timeline um, and who would who would report that information to the family once that is discovered? So that's right, Kim. Pathologists are sort of seen as the the backroom um, guys in this process, uh, but we're an important part of the therapeutic team for patients with pneumonias, yeah. and so we're producing reports that the clinicians, and patients, and their families rely on. Uh, for um, treatment purposes and prognostic purposes. And so the histopathology report, which is based around the microscopy, takes about four to five working days to, to come through to the clinic. Uh, some of the molecular tests uh, that we would now routinely do on ependymomas take a different lengths of time. The sort of DNA methylation profiling that I referred to as bringing out these distinctions between the tumors at uh, different anatomic sites. Uh, that takes between four or five working days. But the sequencing that's looking at the gene mutations and other abnormalities in the tumor cells, that can be a little more prolonged, say between 15 and 30 days. So depending on the type of genetic uh, alteration we're talking about, depending, about uh, depending upon the type of sequencing test we're talking about. So this can be a little bit variable. And of course, 
the sequencing, the molecular tests are being done by the molecular pathologists. And so these are generating separate reports. And when it comes to feeding this information back to the patient and family, it's uh, a combined job, really, because um, you can use one of two approaches. One is that uh, the pathologist can bring together all this different information on histopathology and on the molecular aspects and produces an integrated report. And this is how we do things at St. Jude. The pathologist pulls in all the information and produces an integrated diagnosis, combining all this information that the uh, neuro-oncologist uh, can use in the clinic. In other centers, it might be different. It might be the clinician who pulls together the information from the different reports. Either way, what's presented to the patient now is a much more uh, detailed set of analyses uh, with which to inform treatment. Great. Thank you. Well, now that kind of is a good segue into the, the kind of the new changes. So the C Impact Now Update 7 was released this summer. In 2000, July of 2020, and um, I know that there's some significant um, updates in there, and I was hoping that, um, you know, if you could kind of walk us through some of those updates and um, explain um, how that relates to, you know, families and, and, and patient uh, trajectories. Yes, so uh, the C-IMPACT team, Kim, uh, was formed to evaluate, recommend, and publish proposed changes to future CNS classifications at a time when we felt, that's the neuro-oncology and neuropathology communities, felt that information was really marching ahead of the current WHO classification. So the aims of the group were to provide a consensus review of the novel diagnostically relevant data to solicit input from our community and to provide some guidelines for practicing diagnosticians. And the CMPAC group as a whole is made up of 12 neuropathologists from across the world and six clinicians from across the world specializing in the treatment of brain tumors. And from this uh, larger group, we would break out working committees to address specific questions. And one of the questions that we addressed most recently was the classification of ependymomas because of all the advances that had been going on. We really felt that the WHO classification of the future should be updated uh, to reflect these advances. And so we set up a working committee uh, made up of uh, pathologists and uh, clinicians, 11 people all together, uh, about an equal split between those two disciplines. And we worked around the uh, study of Christian Piper that had been published in 2016, which showed the importance of anatomy, showed importance of this molecular grouping that happens with DNA methylation profiling, and also the related genetic alterations that went with each of the groups that, that were so defined. And so, um, we move towards uh, a recommendation that involves splitting out ependymomes by anatomic site into the three major compartments of the central nervous system, supradentorial, posterior, posterior, and spinal. And we made a distinction at each of these anatomic sites between the major molecular groups that are characterized either by distinct DNA methylation profiling or by distinctive genetic alterations. And so the recommended classification of ependymal tumors really looks very different now uh, to how uh, it did in 2016. And so we've worked uh, as a team um, to take this forward into the next WHO classification, which will be published in April, 2021. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, so would you be willing to uh, kind of walk through some of the changes in supratentorial and posterior fossa and then spinal cord? Sure. So uh, the um, three supratentorial ependymomas in the recommended classification were divided according to molecular group 
there's a molecular group that makes up about 70% of uh, cases um, of a supertentorial ependymoma in children that has a C11 ORF95 fusion. Now, C11 ORF95 is a putative gene uh, um, and it fuses with a number of other gene partners, notably REL-A from uh, the previous classification and forms perhaps the biggest of the molecular groups within uh, among the supertentorial pendomomas, a smaller group perhaps representing 30% of tumors, perhaps uh, not quite as much as that, have this YAP1 fusion. Finally, um, in order to address uh, tumors that lack either of these key alterations, and also to help centers that perhaps uh, don't have the um, access to the sort of testing that will show up um, these other alterations. We have another category of supertentorial uh, pendomoma uh, with which to make a diagnosis. In the posterior fossa, we see two major groups split by um, uh, DNA methylation profiling, and these are called PFA and PFB. PFA tumors are the ones that really occur in young children, and the PFB tumors are the ones that occur in adolescents and young adults. Again, we have a category that's not defined by its molecular abnormality and it remains posterior phosphopendomoma alone. In the spinal compartment, we have spinal ependymoma alone, but we also have a very recently identified tumor with MICN amplification, MICN's a gene often associated in brain tumors with a more aggressive biological behavior. And in this instance, it does seem that the identification of spinal pendomoma MICN amplified is an important thing because it has a poorer prognosis than other types of spinal tumor. Finally, there are the mix of papillary ependymoma and subependymoma, which have been in the classification for a long time now. They stand on their own in molecular grouping um, uh, and separate out from the other tumors. But within uh, those particular histologic variants, uh, there doesn't seem to be a clinical advantage at the moment for identifying separate molecular groups or genetic alterations. So they remain the, the same as they have done in previous classifications. So you mentioned that the WHO would recognize, or this would be submitted and potentially recognized in April of 2021. Um, in your experience, when would people, once the WHO recognizes those, um, these new criteria, when would people start to see that um, in their local facilities? So as soon as the uh, WHO, new edition of the WHO classification is published, it really becomes standard of care for, uh, for patients with brain tumors. And so uh, really uh, clinics should be using this information uh, straight away. So pathologists need to recognize the um, changes that have taken place. I think about ways of introducing testing to define the uh, molecular aspects of the tumors so that a, a, a diagnosis of some of those ependymoma entities with molecular alterations can be made and so it's gonna it's gonna involve quite a um, a change in practice for patients uh, for, with ependymo uh, pen, tumors when it comes to what the pathologist is doing in the lab and so um, hopefully this will lead to uh, an increased uh, refinement in therapeutic pro uh, approaches in due course Great, thank you. And that's a, another great segue to um, Dr. Gilbert. And we can kind of start to dig into the clinical impact that, um, that this information will have. Um, Dr. Gilbert, I know that you've been heavily involved in this update and helping to guide these discussions. Um, do you want to just shed some light in, in your role specific to this working group? Sure. So thank you, uh, Kim, and, and thank you, Dr. Ellison. That was an outstanding overview of, of all the efforts that have gone through and uh, what a concise and clear description of the changes and the work that you and, and others have done. And let me, of course, in, in the spirit of some levity, 
compliment the group on the fantastic acronym C Impact Now, just describes it uh, to a T. So, um, you know, uh, Dr. Ellison invited me to to join uh, the subgroup looking at ependymoma. Um, I've been uh, working uh, with ependymoma patients, uh, particularly in the adult setting, uh, since the mid 2000s, and uh, have a very strong research interest in it um, that stems from laboratory through clinical trials. So uh, it was certainly a great honor to be part of that discussion and to add um, the components to the, uh, the classification discussion that I thought would have particular clinical relevance. Um, you know, the more precise the diagnosis, uh, the better we are at evaluating therapies, or in fact, depending upon the molecular findings, um, thinking about uh, very specific treatments. And that would fall under what we would consider the, the umbrella of precision medicine. So a precise diagnosis uh, leading to therapies that are individualized for patients with that specific diagnosis. Uh, what started out um, in the early 2000s as treatment for ependymoma, as Dr. Ellison pointed out, there are now 10 recognized subtypes of ependymoma that are defined by anatomic location, um, histopathology uh, combined with molecular findings. And we know from work that's been done in the last two decades that although they may have a common uh, appearance under the microscope, a lot of features that define ependymoma, they are biologically quite different. Mm -hmm. And so the C impact now adds another layer of refinement um, and having opportunity to, to be one of the clinicians to add that clinical relevance uh, to the, the diagnostic classification, I think was uh, really a terrific opportunity. So the, this idea with the pneumoma of, of including the pathology, molecular sequencing, and and tumor location, is that unique to a pendymoma, or is that do other brain tumors have that component of the location of the tumor? So uh, it is not 100% unique, but I can't think of other cancers with the exception of uh, another uh, uh, uncommon or rare disease. So there, there's a small round blue cell tumor which, if it's present in the posterior fossa, um, is called a medulloblastoma, so um, common location for ependymoma, particularly in, in children. And then if a comparably looking tumor appears in the main part of the brain, the cerebrum, um, it used to be called a primitive neuroectodermal tumor. We now know through molecular profiling in that those cancers, that it's a, it's a pretty broad array of different tumors all having the same appearance. So their location is also uh, very important. But ependymoma now remains a, a disease where that's an integral part of the, of the, the diagnostic classification. Uh, but let's also remember that sometimes the ependymoma can spread. And so we can have a patient with tumor, mm -hmm. posterior fossa, also spinal cord, maybe in the cerebrum, and we don't know where its site of origin is by looking at imaging, but we're often helped by the molecular uh, evaluation. So if we get a, a tumor that we have a, a sample from the brain, because it was the easiest place to get the sample, and the molecular profiling tells us it is a posterior fossa B, then we know it started actually in, in the back part of the brain in the infratentorial space. Mm -hmm. so that often helps us with origin, and we are now obviously uh, working towards taking that information and integrating that into our decision making about treatment. Okay. Great. Um, and so, in the paper, in the C Impact Now update, I know it mentions often the clinical and power significance of molecular. Uh, profiling. Can you explain when it says um, clinical significance, what does that mean? Um, can you just expand on that? Sure. So clinical significance means several things. Um, the first is 
uh, prognosis, right? And Dr. Ellison very appropriately pointed out uh, the discovery um, in the last few years of a type of spinal cord ependymoma, which is was previously unclassified. And in fact, when you use the methylation classifier that he described, it didn't look like any ependymoma. Yet under the microscope, uh, mm. it looks like an ependymoma. And then the discovery in that context that one of the areas on the methylation profiling was a, an unusual finding that there were a lot of copies of the MCN gene. And MCN is known as a, as a cancer gene. So um, groups, there was a, the, the main group at Heidelberg um, who first made this discovery. We had a, a comparable series at the National Cancer Institute. And then uh, our colleagues at Mayo Clinic all sort of came up with the same discovery. And so by recognizing that, um, we also... Uh, had the same information about the fact that these tended to be more aggressive than the typical spinal cord ependymoma. So the biology was different. The likelihood of this cancer spreading in spinal fluid was also much higher. Mm -hmm. So the clinical relevance, of course, is a patient has an operation to remove a spinal cord tumor. The first question we ask now is, do we see this abnormality in MCN? And if we do, then we know we have to be very vi vigilant about looking at the entire spine and brain before we begin treatment. And now we are um, convinced by the collective data that it is so likely to spread that we actually preemptively treat both the brain and spinal cord, mm -hmm. not waiting for the tumor to develop there. And can you um, kind of shed some light on what does the future look like with clinical trials and molecular information? Is that something we should start to see more of those sorts of criteria being included and separated out? Or can you talk more about that? Yes, that's a, that's a fantastic question. That is the future. Um, and so we are very, very fortunate that there has been an international collaboration mm -hmm in the field of ependymoma that has been, you know, the spectrum from laboratory-based scientists, obviously uh, our pathology colleagues have done us uh, an amazing job. Um, it is an uncommon cancer. It has required that people work together, share specimens um, and, and share clinical experience so that we have a much greater understanding of what ependymoma means. It's no longer as Dr. Ellison said, you look down the tube of a microscope and it's a pen, an ependymoma and you write ependymoma and you go home because it's obviously a, a spectrum of disease with at least 10 subtypes. Yeah. And then the challenge is how do you take that information and translate that into effective treatment? And given the differences in, in biology and knowing from other cancers that the descriptor often doesn't tell you enough about the cancer itself to be able to say, just looking under the microscope, that I know exactly how to treat it. It's starting off with a pendemoma and then saying what the subtype is and then asking, are there specific treatments? Um, but if you do the numbers and you start to think about taking an uncommon disease and dividing it by 10, <laughs> You start to look at small numbers in each subgroup, but that doesn't mean that it's any less important that there are the subgroups. So that gets to our need to study what that biology means and then translate that into specific trials. And so if I could, let me give you an example. And Dr. Ellison talked about the relay fusion. He was an integral part of that discovery. It was made uh, at St. Jude uh, by Dr. Richard Gilbertson and his team. Um, it is a, a unique biologic process where the chromosomes in the, in the cell broke apart, a process called chromothripsis, and then they come back together and two genes that typically don't 
know one another, the C11 or 95 and the relay get together. And that actually we know now can drive development of ependymoma. Um, and our, our colleague, uh, Eric Holland, um, was at the University of Washington, has actually recreated this in an animal model by creating this C11 or 95 relay fusion. What, what is the importance of that? Well, it turns out that that fusion creates a protein and that protein drives a pathway which causes the cancer. And if we could target that pathway, we should be able to really impact the cancer. And it turns out it targets a pathway or drives a pathway called NF-kappa B. And the importance is that we actually have treatments that can target NF-kappa B. So in answer to your question, although relay is just a subtype of ependymoma, we actually have a clinical trial at the NCI targeting the relay fusion in adults with, with that subtype of cancer. And of course, our goal would be to have that level of knowledge about all the other subtypes so that we could can develop very specific treatments. Um, and that would be sort of the, the, the consummate goal of all of these collaborations. Thank you for that explanation. Um, and it's also encouraging that that is something that's already being in practice. And um, it sounds like, you know, everything is ready to go in this direction and you're already, you know, starting off in that way. So we're hopeful for those trials in the future to come. I'm um, looking at some of the names um, on the paper. I think it's interesting, as you commented, it's an international effort, but I also think that with a pindemoma, there's pediatric and adult, and even here today we have both. And so just on a molecular uh, or a diagnostic level, um, is, this, this, is this diagnostic information really doesn't have a specific age. It's for, we tend to see certain, some types have more children or more adults, but what I'm hearing is that this information is for both. Uh, children and adults in terms of the molecular WHO criteria. Uh, I would say that's absolutely true with, and Dr. Ellison may want to correct me, but the posterior fossa A tumor, which happens in, in young children, infants, um, I don't know that I have seen a case in an adult. Um, there may be a rare um, case report that I'm not aware of, but that's exclusively, but everything else, um, you can see them in, in children and adults. Mm -hmm. Mixopapillary ependymoma, less common in kids, but happens. Mm -hmm. um, and the Rayleigh fusion tumors, the incidence uh, decreases with age, but even in uh, 40 to 60-year-olds, about 30% of, of ependymoma brain tumors are Rayleigh fusion. And I find it very encouraging that you are all getting together and um, communicating. And I think um, that really demonstrates the importance of this neuro-oncology community and collaboration. Um, can you, you know, both of you have been, you know, involved with CERN for a long time. Um, can you just give uh, Dr. Giller a little background of how CERN kind of um, set the stage for some of this work to now go beyond, um, you know, its initial design? So, yeah, thank you. Um, and, and, you know, being involved with CERN was and remains one of the highlights of my career, which is like Dr. Ellison, uh, been a while. Uh, and, and what it, it, it sort of um, led to what was um, proof that we can actually all collaborate. Um, at the time, there was very little work um, going on in adult ependymoma. Um, the majority of the research efforts um, when CERN was formed in 2006 and formally launched in 2007, most of the work was in the pediatric space. Um, so there was a, a real paucity of knowledge about adult ependymoma. Right. And so we formulated CERN to be a collaboration between um, thought leaders in, in pediatric ependymoma um, and investigators in, a, in adult brain tumors who were not necessarily involved in ependymoma, um, but were really uh, good investigators on brain tumors. 
And the goal was to get them interested and excited about moving part of their research portfolio, uh, both laboratory-based and clinical, uh, to append MoMA. And I think we were quite successful. Um, and through this collaboration, um, that uh, led to what I think was an international uh, effort and a, and a coalescence of work that led to what is a, a spectrum of publications and information um, highlighted by the 2016 publication that talked about the nine subtypes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was those efforts that were collaborative um, that I think have been transformative in the field. And I think CERN was a major part of the, the spark or the impetus uh, that led to this international collaboration. Um, as many people may know, there are consensus conferences where we all assemble now and talk about the latest research um, and how we should all work together to move the field forward. Um, and, and, and that spirit of, of collegiality, I think, uh, is a great model, uh, not only for appendomoma, but for um, CNS cancers, um, and I would say cancer research in general. Great. Um, Dr. Ellison, I just wanted to give you a chance to talk. Um, I know you've mentioned um, Dr. Patchler in, in some of the discussion, but just wanted to give you a chance to kind of talk about the specific to this C Impact Now, Group, just other institutions you're working with and other um, or, or consortiums are kind of just giving us an insight into the ependomoma world that, that we don't get to see um, online and, and, and whatnot. Yes, so uh, Dr. Gilbert's uh, actually mentioned some of these things already and uh, I would highlight the collegiality, our ability to bring together such a great team for the C Impact. Uh, paper, uh, really including all the international experts on the pandemic on the clinical side, those amongst the neuropathology community who've worked uh, in the field of a pandemoma, biology and pathology. And um, so we, we had a great team uh, comprised of six neuropathologists and five clinicians um, representing, as Dr. Gilbert said, both adult and pediatric practice, we had Christian Peitler amongst the team uh, who defined the nine molecular subtypes of a pendomoma. We had Dr. Gilbertson, uh, who's led a lot of the genomic um, analyses on uh, this tumor, and others who've really worked in the field of a pendomoma uh, for a long time, many of whom worked within CERN. And it's been a great privilege to, for me to work at CERN and to work with these experts to come up with the right recommendations for patients with a pendomoma. Thank you. So within the neuro-oncology community, I think it's well established that St. Jude and the NIH are considered expert centers, especially with this disease. Um, and they have you know, a further insight into diagnostic testing, um, especially with your involvement in these, in these working groups. So is the quality of diagnostic testing the same everywhere? So is that something that um, is done and it, it can be repeated in local clinics? Um, are they all, 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 are all molecular tests equal? I guess is the question that I'm trying to ask. So maybe if I can, can answer that one. So clinical laboratories in hospitals throughout North America and elsewhere in the world uh, operate to uh, certain standards that ensure a quality to the nature of the test and the end product. And so um, these are important things to ensure that testing is done correctly. So in that sense, I think that uh, there's a lot of... Um, equity and the quality of the way in which these tests are done across different institutions. But if you look at it in a different way, you can ask the question, are all the tests that are done in a, an individual hospital the same as another uh, hospital's tests? And I think that's where there's great variability. And so some types of tests might be available in some hospitals, but not available in others. And so Here's where um, there might be some discrepancies, and I think here's where uh, 
um, the future classification of pandemoma could be a little bit different uh, from one center to another. Uh, but there's a way to um, handle this. So if an individual pathology department lacks a particular test that would be useful for the diagnosis of a pandemoma, there's always the option to send out tissue to a reference center like um, uh, you know, those in North America that provide multitude of tests for pathology departments around um, uh, the country. And so the types of genetic tests that would be required to show up the abnormalities and the pandemomas that we'd be interested in seeing in order to classify the tumor correctly, those would be available from commercial reference centers. But as well, um, pathologists sometimes seek uh, an individual consultation from a pathology colleague, which would be more about pulling everything together. So uh, looking at the histopathology, but maybe running tests, uh, molecular tests designed specifically uh, to get at some aspect of the tumor uh, biology that will facilitate correct classification. So those are the two mechanisms that I think are available to hospital pathology departments to get some extra help uh, when their own testing uh, resources have, have yet to move forward to the level which we now would expect for the diagnosis of the pandemics. And, and I would add that, um, you know, given the uh, uncommon diagnosis that I would encourage patients um, to, to seek out a center of excellence. And it's um, more likely that those centers would have either the capability, as Dr. Ellison um, discussed, or will know how to get that testing done. And so I can say in the uh, patients with adult ependymoma, um, we do have a very active program at the NCI called NCI Connect, uh, which is supported by the Cancer Moonshot uh, a funding mechanism. And in that program, patients who do enroll, uh, we do all of the molecular testing and it, it's at, of course, no cost to the patient. So uh, there are opportunities there. Um, and we have a very robust uh, clinical research program um, and also uh, uh, studying patients with, with rare CNS cancers, amongst them, of course, uh, ependymoma. So uh, myself and co-led with doc, Dr. Terry Armstrong and then Dr. Marta Peñas Prado uh, leads the, the clinical program. So if, if there are folks um, who are interested, I think we will provide the contact information. Mm -hmm. But I, I encourage every patient with a pandemonia, either, either adult or pediatric, to seek out um, information and consultation at a center of excellence. Mm -hmm. Of course, St. Jude is... is top in the world in pediatrics, but there are a variety of, of centers of excellence uh, mm -hmm. uh, across the country. So when someone, if someone is diagnosed at a regional center and, and goes to a center of excellence for a second opinion, can you give me some insight, um, Dr. Ellison, on how that, how does that slide, you know, go from one hospital to another? I think sometimes it, I families call and say, do I need to make sure that pathology slide gets sent, or can you just shed some light on that, um, again, that behind the scenes interaction between um, slides being requested or sent, or how does that work? Yes, so uh, what we're talking about is what I uh, referred to as the consult. This is the pathologist to pathologist process that seeks to um, gain better insight into the nature of tumor, and St. Jude, um, receives a lot of consults uh, for ependymomas and other uh, pediatric uh, brain tumors. And we're very ha happy to help our pathology colleagues um, in the high-end analysis of these tumors. And so what happens is that a pathologist gathers the material together and submits them uh, to us at St. Jude. And those would be the slides that I talked about, but it would also be um, uh, tissue samples themselves sometimes and uh, with with those samples we can do extra tests at St. Jude that enable us to uh, classify an ependymoma into one of these molecular categories. 
So I know that at the CERN Foundation, we echo your, um, your comments about seeking a second opinion, especially with rare disease, and we feel very passionate about that. Um, and I think something, Dr. Ellison, that you pointed out uh, in a previous conversation was a, a simple question you can ask your current treating team is, are you diagnosing this disease according to the latest WHO standards? And that helps a family understand, you know, what is happening at the center they're at and it might, it might shed more, um, you know, light on them traveling to a different center or at least reaching out. Um, to the both of you, is there any other questions that a family can ask or any other advice uh, for families who are to navigating either a newly diagnosed uh, disease or a recurrent? So, you know, I, I, I would be a strong advocate again for centers of excellence. I would be a strong advocate that uh, both adult and pediatric patients, families contact CERN. Um, uh, Kim, you have been a fantastic resource uh, for these folks and can help them. Um, uh, we know that it is um, a concerning diagnosis. Um, oftentimes, the local healthcare provider is not as familiar uh, with the disease because of its rarity. Um, but people should know that there are experts and resources available. Uh, and that having, um, you know, uh, somebody to talk to who can put things into perspective like you do uh, is extremely helpful. And, and I, I want to, again, state that um, at the National Cancer Institute in our program in the NCI Connect, uh, we welcome uh, patients. Uh, we, we do see folks who are 18 and above. And even with the current COVID crisis, um, are, are still helping folks out. So uh, that, that remains, and we do have active clinical trials uh, for, some, for folks with a pendulum. Thank you. Great. Well, we will um, definitely, at the end of this um, educational event, we'll put some information for both the institutions represented here um, if people do want to reach out and, and have um, further questions or contact. Um, I understand that this is a complex issue and diagnostic information is, I mean, it's taken me a couple years to just really um, understand the process, understand the details, and it's also evolving. So um, we hope that this is really a first of many um, discussions to help people understand this information and help people to get to the um, the resources that they, that they need. Um, and I just want to thank you both so much for your tireless effort. There's so much work that goes into this and um, just a, really a lifelong um, dedication to this. And we're so thankful that there's people out there in the world who care about this rare disease and who are making efforts to try and bring some treatments and some um, healing to us that are suffering with this. Um, I'd like to thank the staff at National Brain Tumor Society for organizing this event. And um, we will put links to the articles that were referenced and um, also some of the institutions that were mentioned. We'll put that in our See Impact Now summary that's on CERN Foundation website. So um, thank you again, everyone. And um, this concludes our uh, educational event. <laughs>